Good morning, everyone, and thank you for coming out this morning. Um, this is a special day in several ways that uh, I'll go into a, a little bit more as we go along. But um, uh, first, I want to introduce myself. I'm Dean Alexander. I'm the superintendent of Hopewell Culture National Historical Park uh, here in Chillicothe. Um, and I'm pleased to welcome you all to the trail opening for the, um, the Hopeton Trail and Overlook and for a celebration of the National Park Service's 100th birthday, which is today. And um, speaking today on this momentous event, we have uh, two guest speakers. Um, the Honorable uh, Glenna Wallace, Chief of the Eastern Shawnee Tribe from Oklahoma, and Dr. Joe Watkins from the National Park Service's Washington office, where he's the Chief of Tribal Relations in American Indian Culture and the American Indian uh, Liaison Officer. And uh, as we get started here, I want to acknowledge um, some of our dignitaries here in the crowd. Um, Senator Bob Peterson, State Senator Bob Peterson, um, has joined us today. And then representing, <laughs> representing uh, State Representative uh, Gary Shearer uh, is Amanda McCoy, and she has a um, proclamation uh, to present. So Amanda, if you want to come up. Good morning. Good morning. We, we hope you're warm enough. <laughs> but uh, uh, glad to see you here. On behalf of Representative Gary Shear and myself, it's my great honor and pleasure to recognize the Hopewell Cultural Natural Historical Park for the ribbon cutting at the Earthworks Trail. It's a great day. We look forward to walking the trail. Not today. Uh, but in the future, and look forward to uh, all the enjoyment of the, the great history that is part of this area and uh, the opportunity to see nature at its finest. Thank you for all that all of you do. Uh, also, uh, Representative Chair couldn't be here today, but same thing on with uh, Senator Peterson had to say, we you know are excited about this program cutting and everything that it's gonna bring down here to the district. Uh, so I enjoy our going on the trail today, so thank you. Also attending today, um, Township, Township Trustee uh, uh, Charlie Schrader has joined us today. Um, the trustees, um, of course, have an important role in maintaining the access down here. Uh, these are Township roads out here. Um, Mayor Luke Finney is not, uh, is not here. Um, we also want to recognize uh, the representatives from the Ohio Department of Corrections um, and Mayor, or uh, super, uh, Superintendent, <laughs> Warden uh, Mark Hooks. Uh, for many, many years, the uh, uh, Ohio Department of Corrections, through their farm programs, um, help maintain the property up here, um, and without their assistance, we wouldn't have been able to, to take care of the property. Um, also want to acknowledge um, uh, G and J Paving, who did the work out here, um, the uh, Avis House, uh, who did the work on the trail, um, and our friends and neighbors, uh, Shelley, um, uh, San, who um, were in, in the midst of negotiating trail access down to the river and um, uh, a donation of property along the river um, that will allow us the room, if we can get the money, to build a bridge across the river so there will actually be a trail connection between Mound City and over here at Hopeton. Um, also want to thank my staff. Uh, they've done a great job in putting this together and particularly Rick uh, Perkins, who headed up the project to uh, build this, uh, this area. Um, and we also want to acknowledge um, uh, one of our former colleagues, uh, Dr. Mark Lynott, um archaeologist who headed up the Midwest Archaeological Center. Um, he probably spent 20 years studying the site. We probably know more about Hopeton and how Hopeton was built um, than any of the other earthworks we have in the park. And that was because of Dr. Lynott's uh, leadership um, and his, his uh, 
willingness to try and examine new methods to uh, find new ways. So thank you to everyone. Um, also want to acknowledge um, we have a group here from the uh, Amateur Radio Association or League, um, and they're doing a thing for the Park Service Centennial called National Parks on the Air, and you can actually see them set up around here uh, uh, broadcasting. We're gathered here because uh, this is a very significant site. Uh, roughly 2,000 years ago, um, American Indians built a major ceremonial space here. So this is a very special place. And in, starting in 1988, the Park Service uh, started acquiring property here to add it uh, to Hopewell Culture National Historical Park or as it was known back, back then, Mound City Group National Monument. And after 28 years of planning and studying and um, getting ready, we're now able to make this area open to the public so the public can come here and learn about um, the great things that um, Native Americans did um, in the eastern part of the United States. Um, we're also gathered here today because this is the centennial of the National Park Service. A um, hundred years ago today, the grandson of a Chillicothe minister and the nephew of a Chillicothe dry goods salesman, um, a guy we know is Woodrow Wilson, whose full name was Thomas Woodrow Wilson, um, signed into law the act creating the National Park Service. Within a year of him signing that, um, America was at war. Chillicothe was being transformed with Camp Sherman. And um, as an um, appeal to patriotism and uh, fundraising, um, they had this wonderful uh, photograph taken where soldiers uh, formed up in the uh, profile of Woodrow Wilson. Um, I don't think anybody knew at the time when this was taken that this image of Woodrow Wilson, the person who signed the law creating the Park Service, uh, was being taken, um, if not within the boundary of what would become a national park, at least adjacent to that boundary, in one of those small ironies uh, of American history. So we're pleased uh, to be involved with this site. This is a really um, exciting site. Um, it's not well recognized uh, throughout the world, and we're working on that with the World Heritage nomination with our friends at the Ohio History Connection. Um, but it's something that every American school kid ought to learn about as they're coming up. Um, because what was done by the folks living here in Ohio and the people who came from around the continent um, to participate uh, in ceremonies here was truly amazing. It was the kind of thing that really wakened your imagination. And so we're hoping that uh, the public will now have more opportunities uh, to have that kind of awakening uh, in their, um, in their uh, acknowledgement. Um, and by adding it to the national park system, um, we've ensured that um, it will be that way forever, for at least as long as there's the United States of America. As uh, my boss's boss, John Jarvis, likes to say, the National Park Service is in the perpetuity business, and that means forever. So. We're here forever, and we hope to make this place available for the public to come and visit forever. Thank you. It's now my pleasure to introduce uh, the Honorable Glenna Wallace, uh, Chief of the Eastern Shawnee Tribe. Glenna. Thank you. He indicated that he didn't want his water bottle messed with, and my voice gives out, so I want my water bottle right here with me. So. Uh, so that you can't take mine. I don't know that there's anything that I can say that Dean has not already touched upon. Uh, this is a particularly meaningful day to me. I have to go back and the first thing I want to say is welcome to our land. Ordinarily I begin welcome to my land because as he indicated 2,000 years ago, American Indians were here. Uh, long before there were people known as Ohioans. But today I say welcome to our land because we are now 
sharing and, and complimenting each other, and I can't tell you what that means to me. I could begin by some numbers. 26, 25, 24, 23, 22, 21, and the number dwindled because that's the number of states my tribe was in. That's the number of states my tribe considered home. My tribe didn't believe, nor did other American Indians believe, that there was a certain tree out there that belonged to a certain person. And while there are clouds in the sky, we don't identify, that's my cloud, and that's your cloud, and that's someone else's cloud. And the same was true with land. Land belonged to all of us. And we didn't understand the differentiation. And we had the freedom to call that our land and to preserve that land. And ultimately, one state at a time, we were denied access to that land. So before I continue that analogy, let me say that this day is particularly meaningful to me because what a wonderful way to observe the 100th anniversary of the National Park Service is to open land and make it accessible to people rather than to take away and to deny. So this simple service here that took hours and hours to plan actually has tremendous meaning. I usually start each talk that I give by saying that for 38 and a half years, I was a college professor and I always taught classes that lasted one hour and 15 minutes in length. And that's how long I talked. Breaking habits of 38 and one half years is difficult to do, but I'm going to do my best to not reach that one hour and 15 minutes or to even approach it. We are here today because of land, and land is an issue that has defined so much of the American Indian history. There were battles, and we were defined by those battles too many times in history. Many of those battles occurred in Ohio. Many of those battles occurred elsewhere. I could go on and on, similar to the short talk that I gave at Sykes Mound, the Battle of Fallen Timbers, St. Clair's defeat, Tippecanoe. There at Tippecanoe, there is a statue, and there is a monument, and it specifies how many people were killed there specifies how many in Ohio, how many here, how many there. And for Indian, it says, loss unknown. I've often said I know that they mean they don't know how many were slain, but they were never more true words spoken, loss unknown. When we were in 26 states and then 25, 24, 23, we ultimately were reduced to being on a reservation here in Ohio along with another tribe, which is now known as the Seneca Cayuga, and my tribe is now known as the Eastern Shawnee, but at that time we were known as the Mixed Band. The Indian Removal Act was passed in 1830. Immediately in 1831, a treaty was signed, and in 1832, that Mixed Band, here from Ohio, the first in the United States to be forcibly removed after the Indian Removal Act was passed. We walked. I had a hard time getting here yesterday. I live right on the border of Oklahoma and Missouri. I actually live in Missouri. So I went to my office in Oklahoma, started in Missouri, went to Oklahoma, came back to Missouri, drove to Arkansas, picked up a plane, went to Chicago, the plane is delayed, spent more time there in Illinois, and then on to Ohio. We walked more than 700 miles. More than 20% of the people died on that. We were taken to a land called Indian Territory. And they didn't have very good GPS systems because they took us to the wrong land. And we ended up in Cherokee Territory, 
and had to move from there back to Indian Territory to where we are today. That was 1832. 1860, you well know, Civil War. We were still Indian Territory, not a state, and so we really didn't have very much law enforcement, and so we were known as hell on the border because we were right there in Missouri State, and they didn't have friendly relationships with Indians either. We had to move again to Kansas. We were there maybe five years. We turned to Indian Territory, and any improvements we had made, we lost. The loss to us is unknown. We've lost our language. In 1870, our population was down to only 69 people. Consequently, we lost our ceremonials because it takes more than that to participate in the ceremonials. We lost our names. We don't know where our Indian names went. We aren't able to do very much in genealogy. We receive names, we don't know why. We don't know when, we don't know where. We don't know why those names were given to us or who gave them to us. So the loss is immense. So that 26 is meaningful to me. But it's meaningful to me because 10 years ago I was elected chief of the Eastern Shawnee tribe. And I vowed that I was going to do the best I could to reestablish our relationship with our homeland, which is Ohio. And so, this, the 100th anniversary, I came back with my tribe. I was elected in 2006. And in 2007, we came back. And just like today, where you are now making it possible for access and for people to be part of the land, in 2007, we had to fight but we ultimately were, de not, were given the opportunity to go to Wapatamaka, uh, some will say Wapatamika. And when we went there, the Ohio History Connection Today Society then went with us. And it was the first time that Shawnees had had access to that land in more than 200 years. As a tribe, we had lost so much that when we came to Ohio, we didn't know what we were coming for. We didn't have a history we were coming in search of. And we came in search of our stories, in search of our places. And we cried. And we danced, even though we didn't know how. And we smoked a peace pipe, although to my knowledge, we had not had a peace pipe in, I couldn't tell you how many years. And we were welcomed, and it was access to the land. That was my first occasion back to Ohio. My second occasion was not a welcoming occasion. I came to listen to a speech by John Sugden, famous author, who was speaking upon Tecumseh. And because Tecumseh was a Shawnee, I wanted to hear that speech. And I was taken to a land that I'd never heard of, and a land I had never seen, and that was the Newark Earthwork Mounds. I say I was taken to. I was not given permission to enter. I was denied access. It was not a pleasant feeling. My life has been a fortunate one that I've been able to travel because of my affiliation with the college for so long that I've spent my life searching places for people to go, significant places, cultural places, traveling around the world and going to about 70 different countries and leading tour groups, spending a lot of time in research, and yet I'm taken to a place where my people had been, where I didn't say that my people built the mounds, but they protected them, they preserved them, they respected them, and we were denied access. And I left that day almost feeling that I had been violated my third trip back, each time has been involved, the major times with mounds, and with the opening of, and the respecting of, and the access to. And so, Sipes was my third. Today, Hopeton is my fourth. I'm hoping that opportunities continue and that I will reach 26. 
So what a monumental occasion today is for the National Park Service, for those of you here in Ohio, those of you here in this county, those of you here in this city, and for those American Indians, Native Americans, who see that we can work together and we can have common goals and all of us can benefit from that. And so today I say to you, I'm so proud to be affiliated with the National Park Service, particularly the word service. I'm so proud that they are preservation oriented and that's what we as American Indians are. I'm so proud that they believe in stewardship and that's a message that I hope I convey to you that now each of us has a responsibility to be good stewards of the land, good stewards of our environment, good stewards of our history, and good stewards of making continued progress. And then of course that we share. So today, you truly have honored me by being here and I want to thank you for what tremendous progress the state of Ohio has made in the 10 years that I have been affiliated, more closely affiliated with you, and say that I am so proud of what you have done, and I look forward to other events in the future where land brings us together rather than separating us. Thank you for this wonderful day. Thank you, Chief Wallace. It's now my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Joe Watkins, the American Indian Liaison Officer for the National Park Service, um, just representative of uh, the kinds of connections the Park Service is hoping to build and foster uh, with the American Indian tribes. So, Dr. Watkins. See Joe Watkins, see Oklahoma. Omishki, Onupo, Tio. Hi, my name is Joe Watkins. I'm a member of the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma. I, I want to say thank you, everyone, for being here. I feel very honored to be here. It's very difficult to follow such wonderful words as the Chief has presented with us here this morning. Um, when I was in Washington last week, I pulled together a, a nice 1,500 word speech, you know, 15 minutes if I speak quickly, 20 minutes if I need to drag it out a little bit. Uh, but with the temperature here and the 20% chance of, of rain, I figure I threw this speech out this morning and probably we'll talk about maybe five to seven minutes and then we can get up, stretch, have a cookie, maybe walk the trails, those of you who are intrepid enough. I almost always start a, a conversation like this with an acknowledgement of the traditional owners of the property where we're meeting. I don't really need to do that today because the chief has presented us with that acknowledgement. Um, I am very honored to be on this land. This land is such a fertile place. If, if you look out, there's wonderful cornfields, this beautiful black walnut grove, a tremendous stand of poison ivy that uh, I'm sure we're all going to avoid. Yes. But 2,000 years ago, this place was a very fertile place indeed. It was a place that led to probably one of the most intensively religious cultures, the mound builders, the... the Mississippian cultures that were the founders of my culture, the Choctaw. This area was a place that brought possibly pilgrims from as far away as Wyoming, from the Gulf Coast, bringing shark teeth and conch shells, from North Carolina with sheets of mica. It's difficult enough for me to transport eggs from the grocery store rather than just to think about bringing a sheet of mica that far. 
they had material here from Ohio, Flint Ridge materials that really didn't leave here. So it was of that much importance that it stayed here. There was lead ore that came from northeast Oklahoma in the form of galena that was used for paint. There was copper from upper Michigan, native copper that was hammered into ornaments, headdresses and such. Back when I was in archaeological puff, back in the mid-1970s, it was thought of as an economic area, maybe the first Sam's Club, whatever. Um, it was thought that the materials were coming here as part of an economic impact, a sphere, if you will, of the Hopewell culture, uh, that the materials came here and then were distributed far and wide. I think that idea has changed more recently into actually recognizing that this place had such ceremonial importance that the people who came here came with a purpose and left with a purpose. They were touched by something that brought them here. And I think it's important to realize that we are here today, we were brought here for a purpose. And I'm hoping that we all leave here with a purpose as well. The National Park Service is tasked with preserving this property unimpaired for future generations, for perpetuity. And I think it's up to each and every one of us, those of us who work for the Park Service, those who volunteer for the Park Service, those who are partners with the Park Service, and those really who just go to enjoy our national parks, and I do say our national parks. I think it's up to us to protect this property from development, from whatever future threats there may be to these properties. It's up to us as individuals, as organizations, to maintain the history that this land tells us. It's up to us to be involved as much as possible in order to preserve the stories that these lands can tell us, especially for our future generations. I have a son and a daughter, 24 and 20, well, yeah, 24 and 25 years old now. They are one quarter uh, Swedish, one quarter Argentine, one quarter Choctaw, about one eighth French, Irish, and the other is American Mongol. <laughs> and they know many more stories about Sweden, about Argentina, than they do know about the unwritten history of American Indians here in North America. Some of that is my fault. Some of that is the fault of the education system that doesn't adequately present American Indian histories. But Again, I'm very glad to be here. I'm very honored to be asked to say a few words here. And I'm pleased that this is only my second time in this area, but I do know that it will not be my last. So with that, thank you very much. For our last act of the uh, program, Cut the Trail. Do we, we have, have a, a second, second set of shears? Or just one? Second, mm, you're checking on that. But it has two handles. So um, I want to I want to surprise uh, Senator Peterson again and ask him if he will help us uh, cut the trail along with uh, Chief Wallace. So if we could step over here. Everyone, the trail is open.